crop-destroying pests have been a major problem for food growers for thousands of years. Today, in the United States alone, more than 20,000 pest species, including insects, weeds, nematodes, bacteria, fungi, and viruses, cause annual losses of over $12 billion. The sheer magnitude of the problem has forced many growers to seek different ways to control these destructive pests. When I came back from college and, and acquired my first grove, uh, all of the work was done with, uh, with uh, chemicals. And, uh, not worrying about uh, the aid of the biological insects helping us. And it didn't take me too many years to, to find out that, that this really wasn't the total answer, that uh, quite often we would spend uh, 50 or $60 an acre for, for chemicals that wouldn't do the total job that we were looking for. So we, so we, were, we were spending a lot of money per acre application on the groves, but we weren't achieving total success. Uh, due to uh, insect resistance. Insects are constantly evolving. Uh, they can rapidly now become resistant to many of the new compounds that are being used to control them. And it's unfortunate, but now that we have these, we, we are aware of these problems, uh, we begin now looking at alternative methods of controlling pestiferous insects. Biological control is a natural alternative. It is the use of natural enemies such as parasites, predators, and pathogens to control crop pests. The greatest advantage to this ecologically sound, environmentally safe method is that once successfully introduced and established, the natural enemies become self-perpetuating control agents, effectively reducing the need for pesticide applications. Many of the most destructive agricultural pest species in the United States have been introduced from foreign countries. They have arrived with the millions of people who cross our borders annually, with commodities imported from abroad or by natural means. And because they often come without their natural enemies, they have been able to proliferate freely. The western strain has the bee band, whereas the eastern strain does not. In biological control, Scientists identify the pest and where it originated. Then they search for, collect, and import its natural enemies and attempt to establish them here. We screen out these hyperparasites uh, of parasites. We check these parasites to make sure that they do not attack something beneficial. And then once we introduce them, we evaluate their impact on the pest. And if they show great potential to control that pest, then we further uh, rear them either in the laboratory or in the field if it's possible and uh, once established then field collecting and redistributing them further uh, within the states. It isn't that they wouldn't eventually distribute themselves throughout the state but to speed up the time of effect from these parasites we make additional releases throughout the state. The method is not new Beneficial agents were first used with success in America in 1889. At that time, an exotic insect, the cottony cushion scale, was destroying the California citrus industry. USDA entomologists were sent to Australia, home of the scale, to search for its natural enemies. In Australia, the Vidalia beetle was found and quickly introduced into California. Within two years, the scale was under complete control to this day, in California and other citrus growing areas, the Vidalia beetle remains an effective beneficial agent controlling this scale pest. Classical biological control projects are completed once natural enemies establish themselves and control is achieved, as in the case of the cereal leaf beetle project. In 1962, federal and state officials adopted biological control methods to suppress this grain pest by using four species of parasitic wasps, 
harmless to humans, that attack the eggs and larvae of the cereal leaf beetle. Parasitic wasps were distributed from the Midwest to the East Coast, resulting in a savings to farmers of $14 million a year in pesticide usage and crop losses. The total project cost about $14 million. Over the years, parasitic wasps have also been used successfully against other pests, such as the citrus black fly and the Comstock mealybug. Beginning in 1959, the USDA's Agricultural Research Service began importing tiny parasitic wasps from Europe to 11 northeastern states, whose farms were suffering under the effects of the destructive alfalfa weevil, which was recognized as the most serious pest of alfalfa in the United States. With 20 to 30 million acres of alfalfa grown annually, another USDA agency, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, has worked with state and federal agencies, universities, grower organizations, and farmers in the nationwide distribution of beneficial parasitic wasps, natural enemies of the alfalfa weevil. Female parasitic wasps lay an egg inside the larva of the adult weevil. When the egg matures, the young wasp grows and feeds from within the weevil, destroying it in the process. 25 years ago, uh, nine out of every 10 fields in the Northeast was being sprayed for this pest. In about a 10 to 15 year period, those parasites uh, increased in sufficient numbers in the field once they become established to start affecting control to the point where uh, spraying has been reduced to maybe one field out of every 10 is sprayed and that's not on a yearly, you know, year to year basis. The cost estimate uh, savings to the growers uh, in alfalfa production has been estimated just in those 11 states alone to be nearly uh, $9 million annually. At the Niles Michigan Biological Control Laboratory, cages of parasitized weevils are stored. When the wasps emerge, they're collected, fed with honey, and stored in refrigerators. To ensure correct ratios of females to males, the wasps are sorted before they're shipped to locations around the country for release. The shipments are made to cooperators in states where the particular species of parasite is not already established. That communication is very important because he or she has to contact key officials in the state and, and essentially notify them that we've got this, this, these beneficial insects available. Many people are just interested in the economics of it. We've got a weevil problem. We want to uh, cut down on uh, manage or cut down on overhead costs and, uh, and so they're saying, what do you have? We'd like to try something else. There are other people who are interested in the program because of the uh, uh, potential hazards of using pesticides in the environment. There's also an increased awareness that the uh, number of pesticides appears to be diminishing because of regulations and restrictions. And uh, many of the growers realize that somewhere down the road they may not have as many to choose from. This field contains all sorts of living organisms and uh, among them are predators and prey. We have lady beetles which feed on the pea aphids. We have uh, lacewing larvae feed on aphids. We have uh, damselflies and surfid flies and minute pirate bugs. 
There must be 15 or 20 different species of beneficial insects out here that feed just on pea aphids. I, for one, believe that, uh, that the utilization of these beneficial insects uh, as biological control agents can be uh, most advantageous to the farmer. The seven-spotted lady beetle is an example of a ferocious predator at work. Its victim, the soft-bodied sap-sucking aphid. Different species of aphids attack a variety of vegetables, field and orchard crops. Established colonies of the seven-spotted or C7 lady beetle already exist on the East Coast, where they have exerted significant control over several species of aphids. A single beetle larva can consume from 800 to 1,000 aphids. By adulthood, one single beetle can consume as many as 5,000 of the pests. Good insects eating bad insects, a classic example of biological control at work. The beetles are reared for distribution in a USDA field station outside of Byron, Georgia. They are collected in large nets mounted in front of four-wheel drive vehicles. The whole idea in aphid as a pest is because it's high numbers in the field, the high density per plant. And with a size of C7, uh, it eats a lot. It needs to eat a lot of aphids, which implies, again, that it can drop densities down dramatically in a field when it comes in and starts feeding and eliminate the need to spray. Uh, in addition, it appears to have a uh, high ability to, uh, to disperse or, or able to spread from one field to the next to detect high densities of aphids or fields with high densities of aphids. After the beetles are collected, they're first machine sorted, then hand sorted, and put in gallon cartons with about 4,000 beetles to each carton. From Byron, they're sent to the lab in Niles, where they're put in large cages and placed on a diet of aphids, homogenized pork, and sugar. Over a period of about 10 weeks, conditions and environmental chambers are modified to simulate the arrival of winter. After spending nine months in hibernation, as many as a million beetles can be pulled from storage and sent to other parts of the country for release. In 1917, a destructive insect was first found feeding on the inside of corn stalks in Massachusetts farm fields. The pest was the European corn borer. As a result of the finding, biological control investigations were immediately undertaken, and by 1938, 24 species of beneficial parasites were imported to the United States. Among the most effective was a parasitic tachinid fly called Lydella thompsoni. The parasite lays its eggs in the opening of the corn borer tunnel on the corn stalk. Larvae travel down the shaft. When they reach the invading corn borer, they burrow inside and begin feeding from inside the host. After pupation, the natural enemy emerges as an adult from the dead corn borer. At the Biological Control Laboratory in Mission, Texas, flies are mass produced by removing the larvae from corn stalks and placing them on a synthetic diet of pinto beans, wheat germ, vitamins, and salt. This is the same diet needed to mass rear the host corn borer. A parasitic wasp is also showing promise for control of the Colorado potato beetle. However, this wasp cannot overwinter, therefore additional releases must be made each year. And to date, the success story that we have with the in the state of New Jersey is where the researchers and the state of New Jersey have been able to demonstrate that they can control Colorado potato beetle on eggplant, on small acreages. Uh, we are working with cooperators, particularly in the state of Massachusetts, with a demonstration project on trying to use biocontrol in controlling the Colorado potato beetle. The primary purpose for rearing the Colorado potato beetle is to provide eggs for the small parasitic wasp that we use in the biocontrol project. The parasitic wasp will actually feed on an egg mass 
the second method that the parasite destroys the eggs is to actually oviposit or lay a small egg inside of the Colorado potato beetle egg. That egg then develops into another parasite. Uh, biocontrol takes time. Uh, that's for sure that it takes a lot of time, but the, the real payoff is that once you have a biocontrol agent established, it's there forever unless some unforeseen problem occurs. Once the organism's established, it's there forever. The great American Northwest, rich in beauty, natural resources, and weeds. In the state of Montana alone, the Extension Service reports that leafy spurge currently infests 550,000 acres of rangeland. Additionally, in just 60 years, spotted knapweed has spread over 2 million acres throughout the state, averaging 33,000 acres a year. Both weeds result in annual rangeland forage losses of over $6 million. If left unchecked, the potential annual loss by the year 2010 in Montana is estimated at $155 million. This is a good example of leafy spurge sort of left unchecked. Leafy spurge is not native to North America. And this plant uh, came to this country without natural enemies. And so this plant, as you see around us, uh, has enjoyed almost 100 years of development without natural enemies to impact upon its health. This location is typical, and uh, usage of herbicides in a location like this would be very expensive for this landowner because of the very limited economic value or return from this type of land. Consequently, many of the acres within Montana and other rangeland areas, uh, control measures by herbicides are not being actively pursued because it, the ranchers simply cannot afford it. The seeds of leafy spurge are often fed upon by various birds, and those birds will fly to new locations, deposit those seeds in the ground, and that will start a new patch. The plant then, through its aggressive root system and through the production of new seeds, will establish dense stands. The aggressive root system of the plant is able to put up many new shoots from a single rootstock. In addition, as the seeds of the plant dry, they seed coat cracks and the seeds are literally propelled through the air up to 15 feet from the parent plant. The spiny knapweed plant has little nutritive value. In addition, because of its toxic qualities, it's generally avoided by animals. Competition from desirable forage is eliminated by the weed's aggressive growth and its ability to form dense uniform stands. Spotted knapweed will aggressively invade well-managed rangeland. Once established, the weed can live up to 10 years, producing 1,000 seeds a year. It's an interesting problem because we're trying to make sure that our organisms we introduce do not impact upon endangered species of plants. But we also want to control these weeds because these weeds in themselves are impacting upon the endangered species. They're crowding out the native plants. Some of the weeds have uh, allelopathic properties. They inhibit other plants from growing near them. So it's important that we control these weeds to not only protect our agriculture, but to protect endangered species. As we know more about the noxious weeds, about their life cycles, and how they react in, in an environment where they, they don't have any natural enemies, uh, we're learning more about them, and we're getting more education on them, and we're realizing that it's going to take a, an integrated approach uh, to controlling these things to actually see some, some long-term effects as the herbicides have their part. Uh, roadsides, uh, large patches where they're, they're just getting established, uh, that type of thing. But they have no place along uh, rivers, uh, environmentally um, uh, sensitive areas, and that type of stuff, or areas where you can't even get into and spray. So, you know, that's where we're looking for alternate controls such as biologicals. Biological control of some weeds can be achieved by the use of pathogens, which are tiny disease-producing organisms. For knapweed and leafy spurge, however, the approach is to establish four or five beneficial insects on the weed, 
attacking different parts of the plant throughout the growing season. For uh, spotted knapweed, we have uh, two moths that are approved biological control agents. One of them is a direct seed feeding moth. And we have been able to acquire this moth through cooperative efforts with Agriculture Canada. Also, we have for this year a first release of another uh, moth that impacts on spotted knapweed. This, this moth uh, does not feed on seed, but it impacts directly on the plant by the larval stage feeding within the root system. We also have a beetle that is root boring. We've been able to collect this beetle in British Columbia and uh, affect releases in Montana as well as Idaho, Washington, and Oregon on stands of diffuse knapweed. The seed head fly, natural enemy of knapweed, has been redistributed in Montana and other areas of the western United States since 1973. About one quarter the size of the common housefly, the seed head fly lays its eggs in the seed head of the knapweed. After hatching, the plant forms a goal which grows around the developing fly larva. This attack by the insect in turn keeps most of the weed's seeds from developing. To quickly establish the seed head fly in weed affected areas, bouquets of fly infested knapweed are placed on fence posts. When the adults emerge, they quickly spread to the uninfested knapweed, lay their eggs, and the process begins again. For control of leafy spurge, approved beneficial agents include a gall midge fly from Italy, whose feeding activity in the shoot tip prevents flowers and seeds from forming. The longhorn beetle from Italy and Hungary lays its eggs on the stem of the plant. Beetle larvae feed in the stem and root crown of the weed. And then there are the three beetles from Hungary, Italy, Austria, and Yugoslavia. The larval stage of these insects feed internally on the root system. The initial introduction and establishment of these biological control agents is perhaps the most critical stage of our biological control program on these exotic weeds. Um, when, when, when one introduces these insects, one wants to select a site that will enhance the survivorship or survival of those agents. Everything looks good on the cage. Yeah, we made our first release in here two and a half weeks ago of 50 oberea, and we added another 25 to it. Look, here's feeding damage. Oh yeah, girdling and... Maybe we are maybe. trying to establish what we call field and sectary sites. Uh, an area where we make a release uh, under a controlled situation, uh, usually within a cage, on uh, weeds that are growing out in nature. And the insects then uh, propagating within that cage or in that local area uh, will be the focal point or the beginning of larger populations that will develop in the weed stands in that area. And uh, that's very exciting. It's a, a very small beginning, but if these beginnings would have happened 20 years ago, we'd be well on our way to establish colonies and populations that would uh, be exhibiting an impact on the weed problem. Biological control methods are also used in waterways where noxious weeds like hydrilla and alligator weed clog and trap debris, reducing flow and volume for irrigation projects. Recreation can also be hampered by aggressive weeds. Chemicals and dredging are sometimes effective in controlling the weeds, but they also tend to be expensive. What is proving cost-effective is a species of fish called the white amour. Used with success in the southeastern United States, California, and elsewhere, this fish has a large appetite for weeds. Biological control won't work on every weed or pest, but where beneficial agents can be used, they are an effective tool in helping suppress pest problems, and as a result, substantially reduce dependence on chemical pesticides. Assisted by Extension Service personnel and other cooperators, growers are learning to modify pesticide applications 
and develop cultural practices that don't interfere with the growth and development of natural enemies. Today, conditions and attitudes dictate an increased emphasis on economical and environmentally safe alternatives for crop pest control. Alternatives such as biological control, a natural alternative.